Thank you, Vincent. I think I speak for all the board members in uh, in thanking you for your contribution. Sometimes your entertainment value on our various <laughs> subcommittees, uh, and and for your kind words today. All right. <laughs> I would like to turn to item 4A, which is now the president's report, and I do understand we have some deputations on this point. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, that person is uh, Ismail Afra. Thank you very much for uh, allowing for this deputation. Uh, uh, good morning, board members, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here today to inform the board of an important piece of information that I feel is missing in the board's knowledge of the agenda item before them today. Uh, when no what normally should happen and is expected to happen from TCH TCHC is that TCHC provides to its stakeholders with an opportunity to provide input into CCHC decisions that affect, that have a huge impact on communities. In the report you have today, there's uh, a, a piece of uh, information I would like to uh, share, which is that it concerns uh, uh, in page uh, four of the CEO of the report. It starts by saying, a meeting will be held in April to inform the community of the launch of phase four and five of the redevelopment of Region Park. We will be launching a two-stage process to seek a development partner for these phases with the proposal call for a development partner targeted in the late spring and early summer. Now, to many of you, this might seem quite uh, procedural, but to people in Regent Park, there was always an understanding that uh, the development of Regent Park from when it first began was a partnership between its existing partner, uh, Daniels, and TCHC. And, well, okay. Uh, the understanding, at least from the part of the community, was that in all the redevelopment phases, Daniels would be the existing partner of developer and this was for the first time in all the years in Legion Park that we have heard that in phases four and five, a rebuild process began and that this was the first time in all of our history and encounter with the, the redevelopment that we first heard of this information. We wanted to understand, uh, when we, when, from our part, it seemed shocking to us that this news first came at this meeting. And we wanted to understand the history that first began of why this news is coming to us right now. Uh, so the understanding of the community was that a single partner had been selected by an open bidding process at the outset of revitalization and that we would be, and they would be with us during the duration. Uh, some background information that would help you understand this assumption on, on our part is that in April of 2009, TCHC had announced on its own website uh, that quote, Toronto Community Housing Today announced plans for the second phase of Regent Park revitalization, including the selection of Daniels Corporation as a developer and construction partner for phase two and all future phases. Indeed, there is no indication on TCHC's current website that there will be a, a rebid process, nor that anyone other than Daniels would be considered. However, TCHC says that when we first asked how, how come this new change, sudden change, at least on our part, uh, this new information came about, we had no prior uh, conversation or consultation or information provided to us that this new re, re change will happen. However, TCAC says that not to sole source has been the policy since 2004. The purchasing policy was actually enacted in 2012 according to the purchasing policy. We need to understand why the policy was changed and why the community was not explicitly informed as well as why contracts that were already in place under a prior purchasing policy would be impacted. It appears from this document that arrangements with Daniels began to change in the relationship, what was referred to as the phase three ABP outline in TCH, TCHC approved change. So it was an anchoring business plan that changed in phase three, I think. And we wanted to understand why uh, this had happened so suddenly. So when we've had 
prior contact with the TCHC staff prior to the April 7 date, we wanted to know what had changed. But from our perspective, uh, from the reaction we got from TCHC was that this is business as usual and that they were not surprised to the least bit why uh, members of the community were uh, concerned, confused, and even outraged. In that conversation we've had, I, was, I asked a specific question, which was uh, this new information that you might, you, that you're doing a rebit process, is it for the least bit? And is there a negative aspect to this whole process? This new information that you're considering a rebit, is there a negative aspect to it at all? And the answer I got was uh, uh, that this was a normal process. We don't see any negative aspect to it. And what was shocking was that the community that were present there, both uh, condos and uh, TCC residents, who were represented by the Region Park Neighborhood Association, uh, that half of us were outraged. And the other side seemed... The, uh, okay. So, so what I wanted to say was that uh, in, the new TCHC is a TCHC of consultation and information, provi providing information to tenants. In this process, it seems like the communication, well, there was a communication cut. We were not consulted in this major decision. We were informed previously. I have with me several community updates that TCHC has done, and in none of them is there talk of uh, a rebit process for phase four and five. So this might all seem to you a normal process, but to us, who are residents who are expecting uh, redevelopment to happen, we need to be provided with this information and, uh, and, and connected to our representative, the RPNA, the Regional Park Neighborhood Association, to, ha to understand that information and communication is key to this redevelopment process. And that meetings have to be consultational and not just uh, being informed about decisions already made. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we have Ms. Mary Henkelman. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, is the next uh, deputy on this matter as well? Yeah. Okay, I and, and I, I'd appreciate some feedback from management when the deputies are finished. <clears throat> Thank you. When I moved into Regent Park nearly seven years ago, I had a number of concerns. Okay, I had a number of concerns. I knew that the Garden City model had guided the development of the first Regent Park. But 20 years after that build, people looked back and wondered, why were they so stupid? Didn't they know that they were creating a stigmatized neighborhood of entrenched poverty? And didn't they know that those green spaces would be used for all kinds of nefarious activities after dark? Now the accepted ideology is to build mixed income neighborhoods. But my fear is still that 20 years after this revitalization process, people will look back and once again say, how stupid. Did they really expect mixed income residents to mix? Didn't they know that the social assistance folks would only become more marginalized in their own neighborhoods? I moved intentionally into Regent Park, but I had no idea what my role would be in this neighborhood. By a series of flukes, I became heavily involved in creating the new Regent Park Neighborhood Association, a role which took me totally by surprise. It demanded tons of new learning and tons of volunteer hours. But it has been my privilege to serve my mixed income neighborhood in ways that I hope will bring it together. And I was delighted when we managed to get elected representatives from all 31 buildings in Regent Park. But perhaps my greatest surprise was the way my RPNA experience changed me. Now when I read and think and talk about the issues of our city and our neighborhood, I understand these issues, not just in conceptual terms or as policies and procedures, but in deeply rooted human terms. I know the stories, aspirations, 
and lived experience of those who actually make this mixed income neighborhood their home. The verdict is still out on the success of mixed income neighborhoods. But I believe two things are absolutely necessary. One, there must be concerted and creative effort by all stakeholders to ensure that mixed income neighborhoods actually mix. And two, there must be genuine consultation, not major after major decisions have already been made, but before. Because if you are to create a successful neighborhood, you need that deeply rooted human input that comes from residents. And in a high profile neighborhood, you don't want the reporters coming back 20 years later and saying, how could they have been so stupid? Thank you. Thank you. Could we have Ms. Uh, Soraya Ibrahim, please? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Soraya. I've been living in Regent Park for the last 20 years. Um, I raised my three kids there, and I was a part of uh, phase one who moved out and moved back. And I've been seeing uh, the stress, the anxiety uh, community members are going through right now. And hearing the news that we heard on Thursday on the 19th of um, April, uh, I was in tears uh, because I've been seeing all the experience what the family are going through and also those all information been held back from us, not knowing who's coming. Um, the impact will have in Comino 11. Um, people who are working for TCIC or anybody who are stakeholder in the community, majority of them, they don't have experience. We've been seeing the TCIC come and go and trying to update them what we are going through and the promise we've been, uh, been given to us. Uh, but at the same time, right now, and there is a lot of information will be pulled back from us that we didn't know about it, and the anxiety phase four and uh, five are going through. Especially some of them are um, the loved one being harmed or killed the place that they are living at right now. Um, the anxiety and the trauma that they are going through, and I've been working in the community for the last eight, three years. Um, I've been seeing and supporting them in um, um, all the capacities that I can uh, as a neighbor, as a neighborhood association, um, the space that they are in, uh, none of them do want to live on that space right now. But this process, it will make it longer for the people who are living four and five, uh, the anxiety that they are going through, and also the information that being given to them, it doesn't give them what information that they need to have in order to move forward. Um, um, all of the information that being given them, it, the word that they use, they don't understand. Uh, what does that mean? Four and five, uh, they're gonna put it in beds. What is that impact will have in the community members who are living in four and five? Um, we build relationship with the current development. Um, they are not perfect, none of us perfect in this communities as well, but at the same time, you cannot buy relationship that we built the last how many years? and money that whatever that the process that TCAC they are going through and that they are, we are not being consulted. Um, uh, the power is on the top, it's not ground up to consult what neighborhood that we're gonna be built um, collectively. Um, I wanna encourage everyone from here moving forward, anything that decisions that we're making on behalf of the community members uh, need to be consulted not giving the power the information, this is what we're gonna be doing and shut up. Um, that's what we've been dealt the last how many years. And some of the staff members through TCIC, that's how um, uh, the imposing their power to, to, to the to TCIC communities uh, moving forward. Um, and I, I will encourage every one of you guys um, to look into um, moving what we start collectively and building from what we have learned from the past how many years. And um, there is a lot of people who are 
uh, have uh, uh, shared space on the ports of four and five, such as Region Five Islamic Resource Center, that they have a, a space where they play on the basements. That means for the people who are living, um, that is a lot of um, um, removed a lot of, I, I would say, the stress, anxiety, and mental health. That's where they gather. And I, I encourage you to look into that. And also, there was a, a talk about having a library in Region Park. All of this, the change will make a lot of impact in the community members who live here. Um, um, and when we are looking at CCIC, we look at uh, on the top level and imposing everything that um, sitting here, this, the decision that could make could have impact on the life of the people who are living. And I've been working and living and seeing the anxiety, the stress that was brought in uh, revitalization as well. Uh, thank you. We have uh, Ms. Marlene uh, Di Genova, please. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, most of the relative newcomers in Regent Park, like myself, came here because we believe in the ideal of mixed income, multi use neighborhoods as a way of addressing issues such as social justice, personal dignity, fairness, and inclusivity. We wanted to be part of this exciting experiment, an experiment it was, because there was no community like that in Toronto. Uh, and therefore, we put our money where our convictions were. We are the people who bought in, who can come here by choice. We were promised transparency and a voice in the decision-making uh, process. Many things have changed over the years. I've been here seven years now. Uh, fundamental promises have been broken, and the trust and initial place uh, that we initially placed in these promises has been seriously eroded. We've experienced increased density. The balance between it, that that was there for TCH units has dropped from 40% to 25%. The 12 to 15 year plan is now referred to as the 20 year plan, all with no consultation or satisfactory explanation. And now with this latest surprise announcement for phases four and five, we see a watering down, not only of the original vision that we believed in, but also in the promise of our voices being heard. We believe that there's a serious negative impact will be on both TCH and condo residents' quality of life, on the value of all of our homes, and the successful completion of the neighborhood as we've envisioned it. So to this issue at hand, which is why we really come to you, the planned tendering of phases four and five. I believe that it was in 2006 when Mayor Miller announced to the public that the Daniels Corporation would form a 50-50 partnership with TCHC and, I'm sorry, and be responsible for all of the phases in this community. A great many of us have spent years building relationships with, with the various partners. Um, many mistakes have been made, assumptions have been challenged on both sides, and we've been learning together what works in our neighborhood and what doesn't work. This new challenge in change in direction is staggering for many of us. After all our efforts at collaboration, we'll effectively be silenced and we need to begin all over again with someone new. There was a promise that we would be involved, but we've heard that before. You say that nothing will slow down, but we believe that's nonsense. It's not possible. Changing suppliers is a long and costly process, and residents who've been waiting years to relocate will continue to wait. You also say that the RFPs at this time is a mandatory policy. We challenge that. If that's the case, it was also a mandatory policy when you entered phase three. And apparently you broke your own rule in phase three when Daniels purchased the land outright and proceeded with this construction more or less as a preferred supplier. Why can't they still not be considered a preferred supplier? This is a common occurrence in many uh, city and, and, and 
government organization. And anyone who's been a preferred supplier knows that to be true. Why are they not at least given the right of first refusal to save residents the, um, the major slowdown in construction before you move to the disruption of a, an RFP? A new developer will naturally bring their own concepts to the table. Will the promised resources be built? Will there be cost saving shortcuts? Will there be yet another increase in density? And will the plans in our neighborhood change? How are we to know? We don't get answers. Do they include the new library and possible daycare center and new places for people to, to gather? When Vic Vickery Bowles, the head of libraries, came to our neighborhood, she talked about the $16.3 million allocated to a beautiful new library in Regent Park to be spent in the years 2018 and 19 and fully approved by the city council. What would be the future of those plans? Clearly as residents, we have serious concerns about the disruption to our community that your decision to change course will bring. If there are for any reasons why you wish to to stop using Daniels, you need to be up front and let us know why. Um, until then, it's always going to be a suspect uh, process. And this is not just about, I know, this is ju not just about Daniels. We would have felt this way if it was any single developer. It's essential that a greater, greater trust be developed between our residents and TCHC, because right now it's not there. There also needs to be a very clear understanding by all parties that RPNA speaks for our community and that we will always demand a voice in determining our own destiny. Once voices have been found, there's no turning back. I have one more sentence. Regent Park is a unique neighborhood. We have an opportunity of working together with mutual respect to be an example of how vibrant cities can recreate themselves to the benefit of all citizens. People all over the world are watching us. We need to succeed, and we can only do that if we work together. Thank you for your time. Yeah, uh, Ms. Cheryl Duggan, please. Association's done a really good job presenting today. You brought up a number of serious issues. Um, I'm going to take a sharp left here. Um, I brought you some show and tell today. This is how this works. Um, now I'm going to deal with top of page seven of the president and chief executive officer's report reads in part development of communication strategy for the Senate engagement week, fresh was initiated with a top priority placed on communication with existing tenant representatives. When you speak to them, could you do me a favor? Ask them if they recycle. Because I firmly believe that all attempts at a tenant engagement refresh should be afforded until TCHC has a handle on appropriate disposal methods. If the extension of my balcony is a microcosm of TCHC disposable, disposal practices, we have a serious issue. TCHC should be a leader in recycling. Instead, they are paying how much to have dump dumpsters of recyclable materials transported to landfills. The items I brought today include items from my spring cleanup. Um, now in here, we have a rusted metal bracket. There were five of these in total that landed on my balcony. Okay. We also have a cracked pipe with fragments. Very deep. And pieces of insulation. Now let me tell you how this stuff, there was three garbage bags full of this stuff. Okay, so somebody's obviously renovating your unit. 
and we also have from this trip alone from this cleanup time we have 10 lighters literally one of every color of the rainbow okay other items on my extension for blankets a doormat several articles of clothing including an adult diaper socks underwear bra sweater running shoes hat with for ear flaps numerous cans and plastic bottles an empty multi canadian beer case a used condom and too many cigarette butts to count oh by the way how is that fire safety train coming along now since the cleanup at the beginning of last week other items have magically appeared on my my balcony these include a pair of men's boxer briefs Yep. And we have the remnants of a mango hit and peel. that you know that the, the water will be off on May 1st well I'm glad he thinks that my extension is the recycle bin but it's not and that's you know that's a notice for me so I don't get it okay I've lived in my unit for 13 years now I suspect that if I didn't clean that balcony extension every once in a while that it would be full to overflowing by now and we're talking about about an 18 18 foot wide about eight feet out and three feet high that space would be overflowing seriously how is it how fair is it that this that i can't turn this into additional green space but they can use this as their dumpster their recycling bin and their ash cart. now in the event that tchc insists on moving ahead with its tenant engagement refreshment and make a few suggestions Toronto Housing should send out a questionnaire to all tenants asking what they would like to see in the new tenant engagement system. TCHC tenant rep should serve no more than three consecutive terms. The tenant rep should have monthly meetings with tenants that they supposedly represent, especially given that tenant reps are currently regulated to meet with on-site staff once a month and have monthly operating unit meetings with other tenant reps. Mm -hmm. These monthly community-based Tenant rep meetings should be documented with both agendas and minutes. That way we could avoid the whole they said, she said scenario in the future. All TCHC tenant reps should have access to appropriate training and workshops, time management, note taking, basic accounting, grant writing, advocacy, and trust management. TCHC tenant reps should elect operating unit reps that would meet every other month or seasonally. TCHC staff need to be trained to support those of us who are actually willing to go above and beyond. Three more points. TCHC reps should be versed in TCHC conflict of interest policy. TCHC should define in greater detail what it takes for tenant reps to be removed from their position and replacement procedure, both within their community and at board level. TCHC should consider the possibility of honorariums for incoming tenant reps and manage to serve from year to year in a more transparent system that holds them to a level of accountability that far exceeds that of previous tenant reps. Provided, of course, that you accept the, all the imposed recommendations. Thank you. Uh, that's all the deputations we have. Okay, sorry. Will, will you uh, will you be providing us with your notes? Thank you. Appreciate that. I just it it's not typical that the board comments on deputations, but given the uh, level of interest in. Uh, the redevelopment at Regent Park. I, I did want to make a couple of comments on it. That I don't expect them to be uh, complete and wholesome, but I did. There 
seems to be some concern um, in, and some lack of cl uh, clarity in terms of the process. Um, in, so Toronto Community Housing is a, is a public organization. It's owned by the City of Toronto. And as a result of that, it actually is required to have, to abide by open, uh, competitive um, public procurement principles. That remains unchanged. I cannot speak to what people profess to be the case, whether they be politicians or former board members back in 2008, but that is the policy that governs this organization and this board. An open and competitive process is a fair and responsible and transparent way to select a development partner uh, for phases four and five in the Regent Park revitalization. And I do want to clarify, this is not a rebid process. You know, four and five, phases four and five have never been awarded. They have not been. They have not come to this board. They have not come to the subcommittees. So despite what may have been said by previous mayors or previous individuals, four and five have not been awarded. Um, I think the process also enables us to get the best social and financial, so not, and I stress social, value from the partnership, leading to the best possible outcome for the tenants and the residents within Regent Park and the new residents within Regent Park. And our goal is to ensure that the uh, vision tenants have helped us to develop over the past 12 years continues in phases four and five. So it is a, uh, it's work that's already begun in Regent Park. And I do want to, uh, um, there seemed to be an understanding that somehow Daniels was not being considered in this discussion. Daniels has been a very strong partner with Toronto Community Housing in Regent Park. Toronto Community Housing is, has designed its vision for Regent Park in consultation with Daniels and in consultation with residents and in consultation with a broader group of stakeholders. So to presume that Daniels Corporation uh, is not, um, not going to be considered in the responses to phase four and five, should Daniels choose to participate in that, is blatantly incorrect. So I did want to, again, it's not our position to comment typically on deputations, but I did, I did want to clarify that point. Clearly, you know, there is anxiety around that, and I think that, and I'm sure as Kathy listened to the deputations as well, she came to the conclusion that there is a need for greater communication so that people do understand that process. And I know from working with Kathy these past few months, she's very committed to uh, tenant engagement in ensuring that tenants and other stakeholders in the community uh, hear her voice and are heard. Councillor Cressy. Uh, well, thank you. I just wanted to, to expand on that and say a few things. First of all, uh, revitalizations are fundamentally about people, not just buildings. And to that degree, I want to thank the residents, the people of Regent Park who are here today to speak. I would say that there are um, two overarching principles that have been critical in the last number of years of revitalization. First and foremost is that the success of the revitalization is, is because it is being community-led. And again, revitalizations are about people, not just in terms of what is created, the buildings and the social infrastructure, but the way in which they are designed and built. And so the success of the revitalization is that it has been community-led, and that principle of community-led is what has to drive the next two phases. And the second thing I would say, to echo what our chair has said, is that Daniels has been a strong partner through the first three phases. Now the selection process, and let me speak from personal experience because I'm the counselor for the area of Alexander Park and we just went through this very same thing. The principle here is that the selection process for awarding a bid has to be open, it has to be accountable, it has to ensure the best possible outcomes for the people of the community. And by that, I'm not talking about dollars and cents. I'm talking about the social infrastructure that will be developed, the amount of jobs that are created and most importantly, the selection process has to involve a say for the residents who live there and who is awarded a contract. So in Alexandra Park, where we've had multiple phases, we just awarded last year the second phase. Tridel did the first phase, and then for the second phase, we had a selection process to ensure the best possible outcome for the people of Alexandra Park. And the community themselves in Alexandra Park were part of that selection process. 
we had the shortlisted teams come forward to present to the community and the community voted and we're part of that selection process. And so rather than the notion that this is unaccountable, I would say it is the complete opposite, that rather than TCHC on its own negotiating and deciding who will carry on phases four and five, it is an open process that the community will be part of deciding on as well. And I think that is the more open and, and proactive way it can be done. Uh, I would just close by saying clearly because this is a community letting uh, revitalization process, the concerns that I've heard speak to the need from an organization-wide standpoint here for greater communication and clarity uh, for all to understand what this means. Uh, but it also, and I want to re-emphasize this in terms of the close, this should remind all of us, including the deputants, that the reason we're doing this is so that the community themselves, the residents themselves, yourselves, can have a say and be aware of what is to come as opposed to us deciding on your behalf. This is to ensure it is the most open, accountable, and to ensure that we get the best outcome possible for the people of Alexander Park, or of Regent Park, just as we did for the people of Alexander Park. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us on just because of the interest of time, and it's, again, it's not Great. difficult. Can, can I make uh, a comment and ask a couple just, of questions? I would just ask you just to be brief, Catherine, just on, on this uh, point. Thanks. Being my last day on the board. I got it. Uh, allowing the tenant director to share her tenant perspective would be much appreciated. So, um, so I have a, a couple of questions. First of all, has the RFP uh, gone out already? Is it publicly accessible on the TCH website? Uh, just to be clear, um, we're just starting the process. So I wanted to make a point as well with respect to communication and consultation that the April 19th meeting is to kick off the process. So we haven't issued anything. The first step in the process will be a request for expression of interest. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that we, why we met with the community. So no, there's nothing that has been decided. We're just starting the consultation and the process of issuing the request for expression of interest. Oh, okay, it kind of sounds like the community doesn't feel they've been consulted at this point. Con consistently, each one has said, I kind of feel left out. And I think I think that was a point that I made in terms of communication. Yeah. Okay, but it's not it's about communication. We're not telling you what we're doing at you, for you, or to you. The consultation is with you. So that's the point I want to make that we can maybe improve that process going forward. So when there will be, an, whether it's a request uh, for expression of interest, will the residents of Region Park be able to publicly access that document? Will they know what's in it? Yes. Yes. They will. Okay, so that's important to me. And then I just had two other questions that, that also come to mind as I'm listening to some of these people who have actually moved out and, and returned. Uh, one of the questions is for management, what percentage of tenants actually return to their communities after a rebite? Is it 50%, 90%? I mean, we've done a lot of rebites. I'm curious how many people come back to where they moved from. We've moved about 1,200 families as part of the Region Park Revite. Um, about 600 of them or so have returned. Wow. Uh, about 10% decide to stay where they are. Another 10% mm -hmm. move out of region. So that speaks a little bit uh, on, the, on the turnover in general in the portfolio. Excellent, which leads me to my final question. Thanks for bearing with me, Mr. Chair. Do we do a post-revite survey that captures the feedback from the residents, what this displacement, what the experience was, how they felt the moves were managed, how they were treated. Uh, do we have such a post revite survey? And if not, I'm recommending that a standard template be implemented, working with the residents themselves to create that document. Thank you. We don't have a, a post revite survey for Regents specifically though. We have worked with a researcher from St. Michael's who did do some follow-up work with our with our tenants on a number of criterion factors, but no, no specific revite survey. That's a terrific idea, Catherine. Yeah, I think there's value to be learned. This won't be the last time we do revite, and so let's get really, really good at what we're doing more of in the future. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Okay, so now with that long introduction to the President's report. I, yes, thank you very much. You. Thank you very much. And again, while the presentation is being set up, I just want to assure the residents of Regent Park 
that we are just starting the process. So it's at the ground floor that we reached out to you and it's not just communication, but consultation. So thank you for your thoughts and sharing those today. Before I actually start in the formal presentation, I too want to just take a moment to uh, reflect on the horrible tragedy that happened in one of our communities. Um, and also recognize that we did lose a tenant, a very vibrant individual, as Kevin had noted, and it's hit the community very hard. I was able to be out there and interact with some of the tenants. And without going through the names again, I too wanted to recognize all the individuals from our team who responded because they came together. We're out there the day that it happened, providing support to the tenants. We've made sure as a corporation that we also supported our employees and huge, huge thanks to everybody who was involved in that. In that so thank you. So you have the written report before you. I will just share some highlights and in the interest of time then I'm gonna be very happy to turn it over to questions and comments or I'll the chair turn it over. First and foremost, I wanted to note that out of the 21 performance goals that we had committed to for the year, these are the performance goals for the corporation, which were also my personal performance goals, 19 of those are either tracking as planned or are exceeding the expectations. The two that aren't tracking to plan are integrated housing management system and the tenant engagement refresh, which a number of tenants had mentioned in their deputations. With respect to integrated housing management, there is currently a work plan being developed that will define the scope, the budget, and the schedule, and that will be presented to our BIPAC committee at the July meeting. We are also in the process of picking the vendor. And incidentally, this uh, system, just for the tenants in the audience, is critically important for our team to be able to provide more flexible, responsive services. Right now, we have something in the range of 170 applications that are tenant facing. Not only do these not communicate, but they're also at or beyond their end of life, their DOS space. So when our team is trying to get information, please be a little bit patient because they do have systems restrictions and this system is critically important for us to be able to be more responsive to our tenants. With respect to the tenant engagement refresh, um, Ms. Dugan, you referred to us as well. You gave us a number of points for consideration. And I wanted to point out again that we are just starting down the process. We did uh, delay a bit. The report had gone to the board from the uh, Tenant Staff Advisory Committee in July of 2017, but we're gonna take this year to get it right. And by getting it right, what I mean is that we're gonna be doing a great deal of consultation with tenants to really understand how best to implement the recommendations that were presented in that Tenant Staff Advisory Meeting and I'm also very pleased to indicate that we do recognize this is a big project and as a consequence, we've appointed a dedicated manager in Julio's right at the back of the room. So we're committed to doing this and doing it right. We are gonna go through the consultation and the development of the process this year and we'll have it in place by early 2019. A couple of key points. I've mentioned this before at previous meetings that to me, Physical safety and security is a huge issue in our buildings. This was the number one issue that tenants told us was their concern in the 2017 satisfaction survey that we did. And it's something that we really need to bring more focus on. We've been very focused on fire safety, but there are in fact far more incidents of violent crime and antisocial behavior in our communities. So we need to bring the same sort of focus on it. We are starting a pilot or we're developing a pilot project for Dan Harrison community, which is one of the communities of greatest concern, and we will have increased CSU presence there. So we'll be reporting on that more as we develop the pilot. The other matter that is very much of importance to us is looking at the priority transfer process. And that's why Graham's gonna be providing a separate update with respect to the process that we are undertaking and the status of implementing the new crisis priority category that was recommended by the Ombudsman. In terms of quality homes, we know we have a lot of work to do. We are investing in our communities, as everybody knows, hopefully, that we've got a record $300 million to invest in our communities this year for capital renewal. And I'm very pleased to say that we're actually $50.65 million already along the way of doing that $300 million that we have to invest this year. I've been getting feedback from tenants, and while I recognize that doing some of this major work is an inconvenience, it's really important that we do bring the quality of our buildings up so that we can provide our tenants with the clean, safe, well-maintained homes that they're entitled to. With respect to revitalization, we talked about this. I'll just comment again on Regent Park that we're at the beginning. That's why we reached out to you. We're committed to working with you. And there are four other communities 
that we're exploring uh, with a market sounding to see whether or not they provide great opportunities for revitalization. So again, we're committed to doing everything we can to bring up the quality of homes in our communities. This was a great um, event that I was able to attend last Sunday along with our uh, Chief Special Constable, Bill Anderson, who's at the back of the room. Three of our Special Constables were recognized by Toronto Police Services and uh, at an event that was uh, hosted by Chief Saunders and they received recognitions for their commitment to the communities. The three constables are Dominic Kahn, Derek Anderson, and Jason Kirkwood. Dominic and Jason were honored uh, because of a commitment to uh, lead to the arrest of a bank robber. And Derek was honored for his integral role in helping the police arrest an armed suspect. So it was a great recognition and our community, uh, our community safety team works extremely hard to do what they can in terms of ensuring that our communities are safe for our tenants if they possibly can be. The next item is fire life safety. And I have to also recognize that we had another uh, unfortunate tragic fatality on April 19th in Greenwood Towers. And this followed uh, a fatality that occurred in November. The circumstances are that in both these instances, um, a senior did pass away. The uh, November uh, incident was determined to be caused by smoking. And the early indication, although the investigation is still underway for the April incident, is that it was smoking as well. Hugely tragic. We went out there, we're doing special uh, sessions for our tenants. In fact, the Friday of that week, we had our team out there to help them understand how they can help keep themselves and the community safer. We're going to be doing another effort with Toronto Police during a fire safety month in June, where we're going to be going door to door to make sure that tenants have everything that they need information wise to keep themselves and the community safer. But it's a very tragic incident. And obviously we're committed to doing everything we can with respect to keeping our community safer and making sure we're providing information that tenants need to help them keep themselves safer. With respect to the fire safety program, very important, we've hired two uh, fire safety inspectors. And these two positions are intended to mirror the fire prevention inspector positions that Toronto Fire has. And the idea here is that we wanna keep inspecting our own buildings. We might get ahead of the curve. We wanna make sure that we're keeping all the base building systems operating the way they should. We don't wanna wait for Toronto Fire to come in and start finding violations. So this is our commitment to being proactive. And I should also say that with respect to the two very tragic fatalities at Greenwood Towers, uh, the fire was contained to the units in question and all base building life safety fit systems did function. So fortunately the fire didn't spread. It could have been worse if those things wouldn't have happened. And finally, education again, we are uh, launching the new process in March and we're committed to getting out to our buildings and doing everything we can to give tenants the information that they need for their own safety. I do have some statistics with respect to fire life safety. And you'll recall that 2017 was the first year in about 10 years where the number of incidents actually declined. I think there were 30 uh, fewer fires, 26% reduction. And now we looked at Q1. So Q1 of 2018, there was a slight increase from 2017, but overall the trend is still downward. And the points that I would like to note is again, when we're focusing so much on tenant awareness and giving tenants the tools that they need to keep themselves safer, it's important to note that the majority of uh, incidents that we see in our fires, in our, in our buildings, are caused by cooking, arson, and careless smoking in that order. So to the extent that we can help tenants make sure that they're cooking safely, that they're not smoking in a way where potentially it can cause a fire. And obviously with respect to arson, making sure that we're on top of removing any sort of bulk items that might be dumped in the buildings that could create a fire hazard, we're very much committed to that. So that's my update. I would be very happy now to turn it over to questions and comments, Mr. Chairman. Colin, I'll be super brief. On the, um, <clears throat> appreciate the very comprehensive report. Two questions or comments. One is on the first attachment, February, March project status updates, yes. where we have the status. Can we also have a percent achieved where relevant, Colin? Like a percent of goal achieved or, or the like? Where it's applicable, yes. Where applicable. And the second comment, I guess, is on the life safety report, if I go to page 27 of the report, this is a specific comment, but more generally applied. 
the time frame has been moved out a couple of times, it looks like, for performance measures and benchmarks developed. We have the uh, status says green. So it just raises a more general question as to what does a green status mean versus a yellow or red? I'll review that. Thanks, Colin. Catherine? Um, yes, so a couple of things. I know, and I just throw them out there as questions. I'm not going to keep flipping open. I've got the page numbers marked. So on page four, we talked about the procurement law office who came in and assessed our existing procurement practices. And I'm just wondering if there had been consideration to share the results of that report with BIPAC. Uh, procurement uh, was a very keen interest when the auditor uh, general audited Toronto Community Housing, and we need to make sure that our practices are indeed everything we say they are. And if there's areas for improvement, I think it would be helpful for the board to know what those areas for improvement are. We'll undertake to do that. There are definitely more opportunities for improvement with respect to both value for money and also timeliness. So we'll undertake to report oh, to that. Totally agree. And then with respect, and you mentioned this, um, Madam President, in your, in your presentation, with regards to Dan Harrison, I need to say at this table, I did say at the resident services community table, what we're doing here is resurrecting our own version of Tavis on a program that did not work for the city of Toronto. Uh, it might even have been that Tavis was actually in Regent Park and the tenants here are nodding their heads. So we went in, we had dedicated police go into a community. And in this case, we're gonna remove third party security, dedicate six of our safe, safety staff 24 seven to go into the Dan Harrison property to uh, deal with some of the issues that are going on in that community and that's terrific but at the end of the day when they pull up their stakes and they move away the problems come back tenfold if the model was not sustainable for the toronto police services i'm not sure why we here at Toronto community housing think we have a, a a notion that we can solve all the problems by doing this and i'm very concerned Come the day that Toronto Community Housing has to have security practically living on our properties is the time to say we cannot manage uh, our properties effectively. And we need to say to Toronto Police Services, you need to take this on. We don't have the staff or the financial resources to do it. So I'm very concerned about this going forward. It sounds like it's a great plan on paper and in theory it is. We're gonna clean up the place. But at the end of the day, it's not sustainable. And I think it's important to um, report back to the board as to how long this pilot's gonna go on, the success of it, what the long-term sustainability plan is. And, and a question for you, uh, Madam President, have you actually consulted or advised the tenants in this community that that is what's going to be happening? Or are they reading about it? So thank you for all those comments. Uh, I should put it into context that it goes back to the basic principle we need to look at how we provide safety and security services for our tenants and i have to say that um, we need to do this as you noted in collaboration with toronto police uh, matter of fact they have to take the lead in many of these respects because we don't have the ability of, of doing um, holistically what needs to be done so we do have good relationships on the ground but um, the chief and i will be meeting with the police chief in the near future to really talk about how to improve the collaboration between our two organizations the um, pilot that we're doing here is for the community, not just the building. So that's key as well, because if we just go into one building, ultimately what we do is we push the antisocial criminal activity to the next building. So we need to look at it a little bit more holistically there as well. And it's in the context of an overall strategic approach to safety in our community. So this is just part of a bigger picture. We've been working with the uh, local councillor, the ward councillor, and we've been working with the community in terms of how we can make the community safer. Thanks. Did you want to say something? No. Okay, so no, so I'm not finished. Um, I also wanted to ask you with regards to the complaint management process. Um, so there's a decentralized process, and the, it's going to the OUC, the the pilot area, on how they're going to manage complaints. Uh, that's on page seven of the report. That doesn't sound like the complaint process that we've heard at at this board table or at the resident services committee. Uh, it sounds like the pilot project is a decentralized process and the proposed process that Toronto Community Housing was going to roll out in June 
is actually a centralized complaints process. So for clarification, can you tell us what's happening with the complaints, tenant complaints process, how tenants will be consulted in that process, and whether or not it's um, centralized or decentralized? A couple of things, thank you for raising that. Our commitment, by the way, is to be uh, make sure that we've got the appropriate targets in terms of responsiveness to tenants and to provide greater levels of responsiveness. Hopefully, if we do that, then the complaints are going to be reduced because we're going to be providing more direct services. And I just gave some time for Andrew to come up here and to respond overall. So it's just, is it decentralized, not decentralized, and will tenants be consulted before you implement it? So good morning, everyone. Um, quickly to answer your question, Catherine, what's happening in OUC is a version of what's going to be happening at large. Mm -hmm. So we are bringing together what you mentioned, a centralized process, so tenants have access to us. This is a big follow-up from what we did in developing the tenant charter. So this is something that we know is coming. Um, so in respect to a, a process, we will consult, absolutely. Uh, tenants have to understand how they're gonna be involved in the process and how the process will work for them and what they can expect. So. That's hopefully that clarifies what you're looking for in regards to. Sorry, I'm, I'm the a little process. bit confused. You mean it's centralized at each OU? No. So what's happening is a is a version of, of understanding managing complaints within their OU. So Joe is replicating on what, what is coming. She's basically foreshadowing a centralized complaints process. So she's piloting something within her own OU so that she can actually manage and respond to complaints in a in a more systematic and quicker fashion. What's coming is exactly the same, a larger version of that, so that we have it for the corporation. So how will tenants call one number when they have a complaint call, in the future, call, like our, hang on, like our call center? Call or email into one location. One number. Correct. Okay, so dead set against that, I'm sure many other tenants are. We know how the call center works, our one-stop shopping. Yep. This is where I'm saying there has to be tenant consultation. Absolutely. Uh, what I'm reading in the report actually indicates that uh, ROU management will go we have a duty to accommodate people. So I don't see that as something new that we're trying. And, and then, so I was very concerned about the complaints process and I'm sure our tenants are as well. And then just two other comments. I see that on page 11 and 12, we're no, no longer reporting on the actual number of tenants in arrears. We're talking about a dollar amount only. So I'm not sure what comfort this board has knowing dollar amount of arrears versus number of tenants or households that are in arrears, but it does concern me. I also note we're no longer reporting on the actual number of vacant units or units that are uninhabitable or held for operational purposes. I know that's been subject to public conversation and perhaps that's why that, that's disappeared as well. And then the last comment I want to make is on fire life safety. I. I am very uncomfortable that we would uh, identify the cause of the fire at Greenwood Towers. I'm not sure I see the end purpose in that. A little bit uncomfortable with that. Uh, but in terms of fire life safety, uh, Madam uh, CEO, you've indicated we, we're going to do some, po we've done posters, we put some newsletters out, we put out some website notices, but I'm here to tell you that these methods will not save lives until we're out there going you know door to door face to face with our tenants that's going to be the best way to have a personal conversation with tenants that is what's going to save life okay thank you and you're absolutely right and that's why i indicated that particularly in june during fire safety awareness month we're going to be going door to door uh, we collaborate with toronto fire on this and they're very influential in terms of helping deliver the message to our tenants and you're absolutely right. That's also why we were out at Greenwood Towers on the Friday when that incident happened, just to make sure that we're communicating with tenants directly. We're giving them information in terms of how they can help keep themselves and the community safer. And I absolutely agree that the best way to influence tenant behaviors in terms of making sure that they're not inadvertently putting themselves at risk is that sort of interaction. So the posters, the uh, the other things we're doing, it's only one part of the overall strategy to make sure that we're getting information to our tenants in the most appropriate way. So I, I just want to say we have tenants who are very eager in our communities to get out there and engage and, and help educate tenants around this. We have staff that are actually willing to do that too. I think we need to, to step it up a little and we need to take advantage of those individuals. Uh, this isn't having a fire or not having a fire, living or dying, that's what's before us. 
If it's going to take us six months to a year to figure out how to do that up close and personal, how many more fires will happen while we're working on a process? And how many more lives will be lost? So I'm, I'm asking that we can, in terms of an engagement point of view, look at those communities. We have staff that would be willing to work with the residents. Let's see if we can move that process up a little quicker, maybe. That's what we're doing. Thank you.